Today we're going to be covering the i5 12400F, which is 6 cores, 12 threads, with no E cores. And this is on Intel's latest and greatest 12th generation LGA 1700. Now, on the surface, this CPU is going to look like it is phenomenal value, which it is on the surface. But I'm going to be talking about a lot of the other factors you may want to consider if you're looking to get this CPU, especially not just for gaming, but for doing other things like video editing. So let's get straight into those benchmarks right after this sponsor spot. Are you tired of seeing this annoying activate Windows message? Then if so, today's video sponsor SCD Keys has you covered. For as little as $14 using the coupon code BFTYC, you can get activated today. Works for Windows 11 Pro too. Links in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City, and here we're testing the gaming benchmark numbers for you with DDR4 memory. And we tested this at 3600 megahertz across four sticks. And we also tested today's uh, gaming numbers with a 6900 XT, which I do believe the 12400F, which is actually not a bad idea to consider a coupling with high-end graphics cards, especially of course, if you wanna max out the settings, which in today's numbers, we are throwing in three games where we tested at more higher settings, putting more of a strain on the GPU. And then three of the games we tested at lower settings just to put more of a strain on the actual CPU. Starting off with the Horizon Zero Dawn, even at the max settings, this thing was getting over 180 average FPS at 1080p. The 1% and 0.1% lows were looking absolutely phenomenal. And of course, it's scoring a victory over the ever popular Ryzen 5 3600. But it is important to point out that AMD's 5600X and also their 5800X are very capable CPUs. And if you got one of these CPUs, you don't really have to worry about upgrading to a DDR5 platform, at least not for the foreseeable future. And so this trend will continue on with a few of the other games. You're gonna see if we pull up Apex Legends, here's where we tested in multiplayer game doing real benchmarks, though I did decide to test the same area using the same time format. And here's where we got 223 average FPS on the 12400F. Again, beating that of the 3600 by quite a healthy margin. So it is a very capable 1080p gaming CPU that is coming under 200 US dollars. The next title for you guys is New World and here is where we actually tested at very high settings and we're still getting close to 200 average FPS. The one thing to point out, at least in the benchmarks I was doing here, was that at this FPS, after we ran the benchmark for a while, the 1% 0.1% lows were kind of, reminds me of GTA 5, where it seems like the higher FPS you get to a certain level, it'll start breaking the game engine and therefore it'll just cause stuttering. And that's kind of what we saw with the 12400F. In other words, it's more than capable of playing New World with all the FPS the game engine itself can deliver. So if you're feeling competitive and you want to play Age of Empires 4, even if you've got higher settings on, here is where we scored 144 average FPS, actually coming very close to some of the best CPUs like the 12900K on the market. And I'm even showing the 12900K numbers here with DDR5 memory. So it's not even that far off the 12900K for Age of Empires 4. So very impressed with that, but also impressed with the 1% and 0.1% lows. They were very smooth when it came to this title. The next title we're gonna pull up for you guys is Red Dead Redemption 2. And here's where we scored over 100 average FPS. And this game isn't known as the best game for getting high FPS. But of course, if you wanted to enjoy this game with close to 120 average FPS smooth experience, this CPU will deliver that. The last title we're pulling up for you guys is Fortnite. And here's where we tested with the popular low graphic settings with epic view distance which is a popular among pro players. And in this game, if you're looking to get over 240 FPS average, then this CPU will deliver. And if you're looking to get the absolute max FPS, however, then the 12900K does come in with a healthy lead, pretty much above all other CPUs, but that is tested with DDR5. And of course, the 12900K is going to set you back a lot more money, not just in the CPU costs alone, but also all the other variables you'll have to add like a more expensive motherboard cooler etc so what we've got there with the gaming numbers is a cpu that is more than capable of giving you a very smooth experience with very competitive numbers however i am going to draw a little bit away from the praise of the cpu and pull up the power consumption whilst we're gaming and here is where the 12400f actually does considerably poorer than previous generation cpus 
like the 10400F, for example. And the 10400F, I really liked this CPU when it was launched. I thought the motherboard costs were very inexpensive, and also you could pick up some cheap 2666 megahertz memory and then undervolt and tune that, and you had a very good, low powered efficient gaming PC. Even to this date, it's still a very good option. And so this power consumption, even though we're getting more FPS, it's actually not the best in terms of efficiency from the new 12th gen CPUs. However, when it comes to productivity, here's where it's kind of getting a little bit weird because the efficiency for productivity is actually a lot better if you were to compare the raw performance you're getting for the power you were using. So when we look at the Cinebench R23 numbers, this CPU is scoring over 12,000 points, which for a budget six core, is really high and then for the single core we're getting 1657 points which again is really good and in terms of clock speeds you're going to get four gigahertz out of the box all core 4.4 on single core and then moving over to core 1.3 benchmark i actually and i can't say the full name because i just don't want any trouble coming at tech yes city and here in this benchmark we got a little over two minutes which is a very good score again for a CPU of an F variant and its cost. Then the last of the two benchmarks here for productivity is the Adobe Premiere Pro benchmark, which I'm sure a lot of people are gonna even think about this CPU, not just for gaming, but also for a budget productivity CPU. And here is where we got a phenomenal score where I did a 4K 40 megabits per second render in MP4. Now the final benchmark is Firestrike where I'm testing out the physics score with the 6900 XT and here's where we came in with 23,716 points which again for a 6 core 12 thread that isn't overclocked out of the box is some very impressive numbers as you can see from the charts here scoring in a similar league of its brother the 5600X. So there it is with the performance very impressive with the 12400F and if you're looking at one of these CPUs you're probably thinking wow it is a great buy coming in at under 200 USD. In Australia, I picked this thing up for 300 roughly Aussie dollars, which does represent phenomenal value for a CPU. However, here's where there's some other things you may wanna consider if you're thinking about buying the CPU. The first being is the CPU cooler itself that comes included. Even though it's better than previous generation coolers that Intel have boxed with their CPUs, because the power consumption on the F variants, even this 12400F, and we'll also talk about it in the 12100F review, the CPU cooler essentially lets the CPU get close to 100 degrees, which then decreases the efficiency of the CPU and essentially using up more power. And so if you're coupling this with a budget motherboard, that's gonna put more strain on the motherboard's VRM as well, which means that the one thing you're buying this for, really good value, you're already losing that if you decide to couple it with the stock cooler. And so we did a full video on this stock cooler here if you wanna check out more information about it, I'll put the link up here. Though in a nutshell, the 12400F CPU cooler just didn't cut it for me personally. If you're a gaming and all you're doing is gaming, then it is okay, but that's the best it gets with this new cooler. But the second negative thing to talk about with the 12400F would be the associated motherboard cost. Because it is using more power than the previous i5 F CPUs, even though it's giving you more performance, it does require a stronger VRM on the motherboard. And so in turn, naturally, this will cost more money just looking at that point alone. However, if we look at the motherboard cost, it looks like the license cost as well on a B660, for example, is going to cost more than a previous B560, for example. So that means more costs need to be outlaid if you're thinking about buying a 12400F from the get-go. And since it is a new socket with LGA 1700, then you are going to have to buy a new motherboard. And with all that data out of the way, it's time to give you guys a conclusion on the 12400F and who do I think it's for and would I be buying it personally? And the answer to the first question is, I think it's for someone looking for a strong CPU for not just gaming, but also productivity, something that can do both. And they'll also wanna go out and get a decent motherboard and as well as a decent cooler. I do recommend coupling this with a better CPU than the box cooler, just because getting near 100 degrees isn't a fun thing when you're doing work 24 seven. And of course, you don't wanna risk something like a blue screen happening while you're doing important work. But what if you're a gamer with a mid-range graphics card or lower, then here's where I would argue you may wanna take a look at the 11400F or the 3600 from AMD, where the associated, not just CPU costs, but the included coolers and the budget motherboards all work in a better synergy 
than this CPU would right here. And so that means you're gonna be saving in the end when it comes to a total figure, a bit more money than just the face value of the CPU. And so that can help you get a better GPU in the process. Or of course, you could just save that money and buy a couple of ounces of silver. There's now time to answer that second question and would I personally buy it? <laughs> and I mean, I already bought it for the purpose of the review on the numbers and checking out the CPU. But if I was putting together a budget gaming rig, I would, just like I said before, I would probably look at going with a 10400F or even something like an i7-10700F where the motherboards are just so much cheaper at the moment on the market. A Z590 motherboard can be had for very cheap and also a 10700F will give you eight cores, 16 threads. Plus if you wanna resell that in the future, I've found that i7 does go a long way especially compared to i5. Even though the i5 12400F is gonna be a better performer, people I've found, this is just tried and true, people just don't care. They see i3 and then they see i7 and they're like, i7, that's gonna be better than i3. And the same goes for the i5. So as it stands with the 12400F, I would actually personally hold off and wait for this CPU to come down a little bit in price and also an H610 motherboard to be released and couple that in with the infamous CPU cooler like the snowman and you're gonna have really happy days. So there it all is with the 12400F review here from Tech Air City. Probably not the one you expected since uh, maybe other people are praising this for such being such a good deal, but I always like to look at the total deal in terms of not just the CPU itself, but all the other factors associated with that purchasing decision. Motherboard, CPU cooler, and stuff like that. And that's why in the past, when I did a 10400F review, for example, I kind of liked that CPU and everyone was uh, beating on it. And it's still, even to this date, a really good option just for raw gaming. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. Also let us know in the comments section below, what do you think of the 12400F? Would you personally go for it, yay or nay? Love reading those thoughts and opinions as always, just like this question of the day here, which comes from MAPE. DHS and they basically ask in a nutshell is having a different fan like for instance the fan on the snowman which is a 12 centimeter fan is that going to use up less power than say the fan on the stock Intel heatsink which is going to spin up faster obviously when it uh, when it has to cool down more heat so that's actually a really good question one that I haven't really looked into a whole lot but from experience I remember I got told that the difference between say this fan and the snowman fan would be like maybe one watt or something like that. It's really minimal when it comes to consumer 12 centimeter and eight, 10 centimeter fans. It's really small power consumption to begin with. We're talking a few watts at best. And so I really don't bother measuring that because in the grand scheme of things, it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference as opposed to keeping the CPU cooler, which in the grand scheme of things, can mean a 20 watt difference. And over the long term, that's much more important for longevity, not just of the life of your components, but also for your power bill, as opposed to say potentially a one watt difference between the fans. Hope that answers that question. And with that aside, if you guys have stayed this far and you're enjoying that Tech Yes content, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell. Also, if you wanna get behind the scenes access to some cool stuff where I just share my thoughts behind the scenes, for as little as a dollar a month, you become a member and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.